I don't know about you, but I love the book of Ephesians. It's one of uh, Paul's epistles that he wrote under house arrest, of course, in Rome. Uh, those prison letters are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And uh, those four epistles are what are known as the prison epistles. But this book is uh, filled with such wonderful doctrines of uh, truth, of our faith, of the foundation of, of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, of our spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. And tonight, uh, we're going to look at praising God for his saving work. And of course, we're studying the book of Ephesians both on Wednesday evening as well as on Sunday evening. Now, in the book of Ephesians, Paul is engaged in what he's doing in verses 3 to 14, uh, he's praising God. His worship is the praise to God for everything that he has done to save us and to bless us in Jesus. Now, he praises all three members of the Trinity for their part in salvation. In verses 3 to 6, Paul praises God the Father for his sovereign work. And of course, the word sovereign means God's in control. Uh, verses 7 through 10, which we're going to look at for this evening, he will be praising God the Son for his saving work. And then this coming Sunday evening, we will be looking at verses 11 through 14 in Ephesians chapter 1, where Paul praises God, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, for his sharing work. So we look first at God's sovereign work tonight. We look at his saving work. And Sunday night, we'll look at praising uh, God, the Holy Spirit, for his sharing work. So here Paul moves from God's work that he's done in the past to his work here in the present. He moves from how God's plan was formulated uh, back in eternity past to how that plan is carried out in the present. And so Paul moves from praising God for this sovereign work in eternity past as he elected, as he predestined, and as he formed the body of Christ uh, to how he's brought that body together in time. Now, up until now, we've been looking back. But in tonight's verses, we're going to begin to look around. Paul continues to reveal all of the riches that we have in God's wonderful grace. And they're ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. So tonight, we see why God is worthy to be praised for his great work in salvation. I think oftentimes as Christians, we become so comfortable in our Christian lives that we really fail to remember uh, that our praise and adoration and our worship to the Lord Jesus Christ should be daily because of what God has done for us. First of all tonight, I want us to look at God is to be praised for his redemption. In verse 7, we find in him, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, the idea here is of redemption. It was common in the ancient world. If you had lived um, hundreds of years ago in that ancient Roman world, during that ancient Roman Empire, during the time of the Apostle Paul, there would have been uh, as many as six million slaves that were there in the Roman Empire. And they would be bought, they would be sold. It became a huge business. In fact, it wasn't uncommon for a family member or a friend uh, to try to seek the release of a slave uh, that they cared about. And so in order to make that happen, the individual would purchase the slave for him or herself, and then they'd grant that slave his or her freedom. Uh, releasing the slave gave, uh, would give the, uh, the slave a certificate stating that they had been redeemed, that they had been released, and they were no longer in slavery. And that certificate or that document was proof that this former slave was now free. 
The Greek word used to describe that kind of transaction is lutro. It means to effect the release of a slave by paying the redemption price. And the form of this word here is used in verse 7 where Paul says, we have redemption. This means that those who are saved, we have been released from that slavery of sin. Every person that's ever been born into the world since the fall in the garden of uh, Eden with Adam and Eve, uh, we've all been a slave to sin. No one is free. No one is free from sin. We're not free from sin's consequences. Every person that is born since uh, Cain came into the world has been born with a sinful nature from the time of Adam and Eve to the present day. Every baby that comes into the world is born with a nature that's defiled and corrupt and evil and, and completely separated from a holy God. Every single one of us that's ever been born into the world, we've born, been born as a slave uh, to sin. And we all face the same fate. We're destined to die. Romans chapter 6 verse 23, Paul said, for the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Even over in the Old Testament, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18 and verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. And so death becomes the ultimate consequence of our slavery to sin. Every person who's ever born into this world is a sinner by birth. And cord, according to Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And then Romans 3.23 says, for all, all is inclusive, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Each one of us are guilty of committing sin. We're sinners by nature, but we're also sinners by choice. And according to Jesus, because we are sinners, then we are slaves to our sin. Look what John said. John the Apostle in John 8, 34 said, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Sin, as you well know, is a cruel taskmaster. It enslaves its victims. It demands a high price for its release. It demands death as the price. And so death being the price that had to be paid for man's redemption. And that's exactly what Jesus did when he went to the cross to liberate you and me from our sins. He gave himself the innocent for the guilty. He was the innocent. You and I are the guilty. So he paid redemption's price so that we might go free. Listen to how the New Testament describes what Jesus did for us. Paul was writing uh, to the Galatian Christians in chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. And then in the book of Galatians chapter 3 verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Then in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, we see where Paul says to the Galatian Christians, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Paul was writing to the Colossian Christians in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom 
we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And then in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, we read, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Notice Jesus shed his blood to satisfy God's just demands for sin. He accomplished everything that was necessary to secure mine and your freedom. And when you look at the verses that speak here in the book of Ephesians of our redemption and those that we just read, you get the idea of what God did for you and me when he took our sins and nailed them to the cross. Here are three more verses that speak of our redemption. Notice in the book of Revelation, chapter 5 and verse 9, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll. In fact, this is uh, from Revelation chapter 5, is, which is what we will be looking at Sunday morning. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. That word redeemed there, it translates from a Greek word, uh, agorazo, which means to do business in the marketplace, to purchase something for oneself. It was used of the person that would go to the marketplace in order to purchase a slave. And that's what Jesus did for you and me. Jesus entered the marketplace of sin, and he paid the full price of our sin by purchasing us, purchasing us for himself. In the book of Galatians chapter 4 and verse 5, it says to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. That word redeem, once again, it comes from uh, the Greek term E-X-A-G-A-R-A-Z-O, Ex agarazo. It's the same word in Revelation that we just read in chapter 5, verse 9, with the prefix added to it. And it means to purchase something for oneself in the marketplace. And Jesus did that for you and me forever. Now, when he redeemed us, not only did he pay redemption's price, but he forever removed from us the sale as a result. He purchased us. He owns us once and for all. Paul was writing to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19 and 20. And Paul said, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you're not your own? Notice he says, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, that word means because of that. Because you and I have been bought at a price. Glorify God. How? In your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And then 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition, from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. There the word redeemed in verse 18, it translates the word lutro. It means to release a slave after the payment of the purchased price. And so this is what Paul is reminding us in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. Jesus came into the world. Jesus died on Calvary's cross, he shed his sinless, perfect blood on that day uh, that would forever satisfy God Almighty. And Jesus purchased uh, his bride, the church. And he has forever removed his bride from the cell, making her eternally secure with him. 
and then Christ set her free from the bondage of her sin and delivering us from sin's power. So he set uh, his church free from the penalty of sin. He set her free so that she could have a new name, uh, a new life of glory in Christ Jesus. Now, while redemption, while the redemption that the Lord gives his people is free, it certainly wasn't cheap. Anyone who, uh, anyone who believes will be saved. Our salvation costs Christ everything, his precious blood. That's why we used to sing the wonderful old hymn. I'm sorry that we don't sing some of these hymns anymore in a modern post-Christian era that we live in. Unfortunately, we've gotten away from singing what can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed uh, and for happy in Jesus, his child, and forever I am. Let me tell you, during the, that Old Testament days of the tabernacle and the temple, there were gallons and gallons and gallons of blood from animals that were shed. But all of that blood could not take away a single sin. All it could do was to be symbolic of covering that sin for a season. But when Jesus died on Calvary's cross, he shed his blood that did what no other blood could ever do. Let me tell you, it was the blood from a perfect man. Uh, and it was his blood that freed you and me from sin stain. It was the only blood that could pay sin's debt created by Adam when he sinned in Eden. And when Jesus spilled that blood, Jesus forever settled the sin problem for all those who will believe in him. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 11 through 14 says, And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. That's the way it was in the Old Testament. But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And then in 1 John chapter 4, 10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation, it means uh, that which satisfies. God is forever satisfied with the Son's sacrifice for salvation. And Paul tells us that this redemption flows to us according to the riches of His grace. Everything that God has done in Jesus comes to us according to the riches of of God's wonderful grace. Maybe it's easier for you to think about it like this. If you were to take, if, if I were to take an offering and uh, let's say some millionaire were sitting out there and he stuck in $20 into the offering plate, he would be giving out of his riches, which most people would be able to do that, uh, to give $20. But if that same millionaire were to give, let's say, $50,000, they would be giving according to their riches. There is a difference in out of and according to. God has not given us a redemption that has limits, but he has given us a redemption that knows no limits. I want you to think with me tonight. He has blessed us. With all spiritual blessings, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Uh, verse 4, he chose us in Christ when? The Bible says before the foundation of the world. Verse 5, 
What else did he do? He adopted us into his family. In verse 4, he changed our lives. In verse 5, he has determined that we will be with him in his heaven someday where we will be like Jesus. And he did all of this. Why? Because it brought him pleasure. Therefore, you and I should be praising God every day of our life. God has given us all that we have in Jesus according to the riches of his grace. When Christ redeemed us, he did it according to the riches of his grace. That means that you and I cannot sin beyond his grace. He just continues to lavish grace upon us from eternity to eternity. And that's why we are told that God is to be praised for his redemption. Point number two. Not only is God to be praised for his redemption, but God is to be praised for the results. Verses 6 and 7 tell us that. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. Let me tell you, there are glorious benefits that we have. You and I, the redeemed, have been released. The forgiveness of sin, we've been pardoned from sin. That means our sins have been put away from us as, as though it had never happened. And when the Lord forgives, the Lord forgets. When John the Baptist testified of Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. In John 1, 29, that phrase, taketh away, means to carry off. Let me tell you, the redeemed, we've been reconciled. According to verse 6, we've been accepted in the beloved. And when we come to Jesus and we're redeemed, everything changes. God accepts us. Let me tell you, we're not as we are in ourselves, but we are made in Jesus, accepted in the beloved. That accepted in the beloved is in the perfect tense, and it could read this way. It could read, I have been accepted, I stand accepted, and I will always be accepted in the beloved. God is to be praised for the results of his grace and love and our lives. But there's a third thing tonight. Not only is God to be praised for his redemption, God is to be praised for the results. He accepted us in the beloved. But lastly, God is to be praised for his reasons. In verses 7 through 10, we read the following. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Why does God redeem the lost? Well, God has reasons uh, to redeem us. Uh, we stand in awe of the wonderful redemptive work of Jesus Christ. What is grace? Well, grace, someone made a little anacronym. G, God's are riches, A, at, C, Christ. E, expense. They are God's riches at Christ's expense. Somebody else defined it this way. It's unmerited love and favor of God for the undeserving. You and I are um, undeserving, yet God in all of his wonderful grace has merited to us who are unmerited in and of ourselves. Verse 9 tells us that God's redemptive plan flows from the mystery of his will. God's whole redemptive plan exists in order to bring glory to God. Verse 8 tells us that God's grace 
has abounded to us word and he's given us notice wisdom and prudence that word wisdom has the idea of sanctified knowledge sanctified set apart it's the ability to understand the things of God that word prudence there refers to understanding and insight and so it's through God's wisdom and prudence that he's made known unto you and to me the mystery of his will God in his grace and for his own glory what did he do he opened our eyes to the deep things of God he's allowed the redeemed to understand matters of life and death he's allowed us to comprehend heaven and hell time and eternity uh, power and influence of sin and the fact of his love for you and me all of those things are hidden from those who are dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1 says. Uh, Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 21, he says in Luke 10, 21, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent, and revealed them to babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. Notice that. Then the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 there. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us. How? Through his spirit. Why? For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. You see, God, for his own glory, opened our eyes and let us see the truth. And he used that truth in order to convict us of our sins and to draw us to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He used that truth to give us faith in order to believe. He used that truth to redeem us, and that makes him worthy of all praise. And then in verse 10, in Ephesians chapter 1, the text reminds us that history is not meaningless or without purpose for God has done everything that he's done to bring everything together in the Lord Jesus Christ God has determined that he is to be the head of all things notice Colossians chapter 2 verse 10 and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power let me tell you in everything Jesus is to have first place in our hearts and lives. Jesus is to be preeminent in our lives. Colossians 1.18 says, and he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Let me tell you, one of these days, the powers that control this world will fall at his feet and will acknowledge him to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. One of these days, Satan will be judged by Jesus and cast into the lake of fire. One of these days, the Lord Jesus Christ will reign upon this earth in glory and power during that millennial age of a thousand years with peace on the earth. God is in control tonight of this world regardless. He's working out his perfect plan that he devised before the world was ever formed. Everything that takes place is a part of that plan. And one day God is going to consummate that plan. And Jesus will receive the glory, the honor, and the worship that is due him. In fact, the book of Revelation, the book of Genesis, Genesis means the beginnings. Revelation will be the consummation of Jesus' plan for this world. Let me tell you, in the end, God will reveal Jesus Christ to be the head of all things to all people. The world ignores him today. The world acts like he doesn't matter today. The world refuses 
to bow to him, to worship to him, to obey him, to love him, to believe in him, to receive him. This world tonight looks like it's spinning out of control, but that's just merely how it appears to look. Let me tell you, God is in the throne room of heaven. And let me tell you, God sits at the right hand of the Father, and God sits there in the control tower of heaven and earth. And let me t tell you, he's demonstrated his power through the Lord Jesus. And the wonder of it all is that God has made you and me and those received that receive him a part of his wonderful plan. He's placed us in Jesus Christ's grace through faith. He's blessed us in Jesus in all spiritual blessings. He's promised to keep us and to allow us one day to rule and reign with Christ Jesus. These things make him worthy of our praise. God has blessed us and in Christ you and I are wealthy people. All spiritual blessings are ours in him. And these truths tonight should cause every Christian to bow before him in humble submission. These truths should cause us to worship, to praise him and honor him for his grace and his glorious gifts. The question tonight is... Are you redeemed? If not, you need to be before it's too late. Redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. The song says, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Will you bow with me as we pray? Dear Father God, tonight... We pause in humble adoration. We pause tonight in praise of this wonderful Jesus who came to shed his blood, to give us redemption, to accept us into his family, and to predestine us to a place called heaven someday. God, thank you for your church. Thank you for your peoples all over the world. Oh God, as we walk through the pages of the book of Ephesians, I pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears, Holy Spirit of the living God, to teach us these doctrinal truths that are so foundation to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and to your saints. Father, if there's someone out there tonight that's never reached out by faith and received the cleansing of your precious blood, I pray, O oh God, that they would see themselves as in a mirror through your word to realize they are a sinner and that you came and died to redeem sinners from the bondage of sin. God, I pray that those that have never met you will confess you and ask forgiveness of sins and ask you to come into their heart and their life and be the Lord of their life. Oh God, I praise you tonight as the Apostle Paul, there under house arrest in Rome, that he gives you praise and glory and adoration through this chapter 1 as it so vividly describes your doxology of praise that he sings to you. Oh God, I pray for people everywhere tonight that are without Christ, that they would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through the conviction of the Holy Spirit of the living God. May you fall fresh on their lives. Oh God, may they see themselves lost and undone and that you reached down to redeem them through your precious blood, to pay the penalty, to satisfy the transaction, to make us secure in you for all eternity. Oh God, I pray that somebody somewhere out there will pray the sinner's prayer and receive you 
as their Lord and their Savior. Thank you for this wonderful Bible study tonight. Oh God, that your Holy Spirit leads us and teaches us into all truth. And God, may our eyes be open, may our ears be receptive, and may we give you praise that you so rightfully deserve. And may we, in absolute submission, fall under your authority. Oh God, we praise you and we thank you for the song of redemption. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.